no son desvelo me de no lo si dupu rosoli honesti posen totelos tofronos welcome back so in this series of conversations, we're going to focus on some of the philosophical and historical background for the Greek concept of the polis. This is a word sometimes translated city-state that underlies the English word politics. We're going to start from the Bronze Age, which is um, before some recorded history in Greek begins. Uh, some of what we'll say goes all the way back as early as 3800 BC, but for the most part, we're going to spend our time in the first millennium, nearer 1100 BC. We're beginning with the so-called Minoan culture, which we'll talk about more in a moment, on the island of Crete in the southern Mediterranean, particularly the city called Knossos, which was later remembered as the seat of the labyrinth. From a social and economic point of view, one of the real hallmark features of life at Knossos seems to have been a culture of resource redistribution centered on the so-called palace. We don't know that it was a palace, it might have been a religious center, uh, or a number of other communal institutions could have operated there. But one thing for sure is that the so-called palaces of Minoan Crete were a center of religious and artistic life. And there were aspects uh, we can recognize in the iconography of that culture that we might be able to find again in Greek history uh, in the periods we'll be spending more time with in our conversations about philosophy. So to start with Knossos is in a way to set the scene for some of the threads we'll recognize again and again. We'll also talk about Mycenae, which is uh, a city on the Greek mainland, uh, the seat of a more martial culture, sometimes called a warrior culture, uh, centered on the king or wanax and speaking Greek that seems to have conquered the island of Crete, but at the same time been permeated by elements of Minoan culture. From Mycenaean culture, we can recognize elements of the quest for honor and immortality that we described in earlier videos, uh, sketching the character of the Homeric hero and their quest for excellence. In a way, we'll find that there are themes from both Minoan Knossos and Bronze Age Mycenae, that we'll recognize later in historical Greek philosophy as well. To try to explain how that's so, we'll also take a bit of time looking at the Greek cultural and philosophical memory that might be attributable to these earlier cultures, even though we have limited access to anything like literary writing for both Minoan Crete, where the language hasn't been deciphered, and for the Mycenaean culture of the Greeks, who were writing in Linear B, an adapted form of the Minoan language script, uh, but mostly accounting and other non-literary material that makes it more difficult for us to recover uh, conceptual history. We will, though, look at, at some of the ways that memories of attitudes to agriculture and social philosophy endured in historical Greece, uh, and particularly how some esoteric traditions um, mystery religions, traditions of initiation, immortality, conceptions of the afterlife, uh, of ecstasy or transformed states of consciousness, and even the oracle at Delphi may have associations with historical memories of these earlier cultures. So let's get started. Some of the, uh, the books and resources I'll be drawing on in this introduction are on the screen as well. Um, Paul Cartledge's Very Short Introduction to Ancient Greece with the Oxford Short Introduction series is a very affordable and simple sketch, uh, city by city or polis by polis, of some of the communities we'll be talking about. Um, Burkert's Greek Religion is still a fairly standard reference that includes some discussion of the Minoan and Mycenaean survivals in later Greece, and an up-to-date and current textbook that is often assigned for Greek history in general is Sarah Pomeroy et al.'s Brief History of Ancient Greece, Politics, Society, and Culture. So let's try to start with a little bit of a sense of geography. Uh, Here is the Mediterranean and a little bit of the Middle Eastern world. We're focusing especially on this region. Uh, we'll be spending a lot of time on the Greek mainland here. Uh, we'll also be discussing some cultural influences from Egypt. You can see the Nile Delta here uh, in the southeast of the picture. 
As we go forward, especially in the next series of videos on pre-Socratic philosophers, we'll also be visiting Italy and Sicily, uh, and we'll also be discussing a lot of events that took place in uh, what's called on the map here Anatolia, sometimes called by the Greeks Asia Minor, uh, roughly the region of modern Turkey. Here's the island of Crete where we're starting out. We're going to be spending time especially with Knossos, uh, the so-called palatial city-state identified here. There's a number of other so-called palaces on the island of Crete as centers of Minoan culture that we'll mention more briefly. We're then going to move to Mycenae here on the Greek mainland in the Argolid, the seat of this more martial warrior Greek-speaking culture, uh, although of course both are, are much more subtle and, and complex than either of those descriptions might capture. We're going to move next to Delphi in the Mount Parnassus region, the seat of the Oracle, and look at some of the influences from these uh, earlier Bronze Age societies on possibly practices and religion at Delphi. Then we're going to spend some more time with the famous cities or poles of Sparta and Athens, which will bring us more into the historical period when Greek is written in an alphabetic script uh, and historiography is kicking off in earnest. This will also set us up well to talk a little more uh, in the next series about Miletus uh, and some of the centers of philosophy that develop in the Anatolian uh, region or in Asia Minor. So let's start off with Knossos and on Crete. Crete uh, sometimes called the island of a hundred cities, uh, divided by maybe about 150 miles, but with remarkable cultural connections. We're going to spend time especially in the second millennium, and we're starting out here, or at least what's underneath here. What you're looking at here is an earlier 20th century reconstruction of the Minoan palace at the site of Knossos in uh, the island of Crete. Uh, and this reconstruction was partly imagined, uh, directed by Sir Arthur Evans, who excavated there. So what was Knossos? This is the, uh, the largest archaeological site on the island of Crete, hailing from the later Bronze Age, even though it was first settled long before that, as early as 7000 BC. Um, the very first uh, so-called palace, and we'll talk a little bit more about these institutions soon, was established sometime in the early second millennium, maybe around 1900 BC, and entered cultural memory, especially for the later Greeks, as the labyrinth, as this extraordinary maze. And there might be a simple truth behind this as well as deeper truths. The simpler truth might be that this was an enormous, incredibly complex, uh, organic complex. Uh, and we know that some of the Greek speakers who came to Crete from the mainland might have been just amazed by its sheer scope and sophistication, um, particularly the difficulty of finding your way from place to place. We're interested in Knossos as a major center of the pre-Greek culture uh, that's dubbed Minoan uh, by the same excavator I mentioned a moment ago, Sir Arthur Evans, after the mythical king and lawgiver Minos. Uh, it was a trading culture with a strong naval or maritime presence and can be seen as situated at the crossroads of Egypt, the Middle East, and Europe, culturally, artistically, linguistically, and iconographically. Uh, there's, there's amazing art, culture, there's even indoor plumbing here. Um, Knossos really spoke to people who learned about Evans' excavations in the earlier 20th century um, for some of these amazing developments. Uh, in the Bronze Age itself, uh, the people of the Minoan culture might have been referred to, um, for example, in Egyptian sources, as the Keftiu, uh, and there's other sources, Hebrew and Akkadian, that might have related names, though this is contested. Um, but one thing that is particularly striking uh, about the art and iconography is the representation of women in positions of religious and political prominence and authority. Um, there's a kind of uh, recognition and celebration of the authority of women in religious and it seems uh, political circumstances as well that's quite striking in contrast to the later Mycenaean developments in art, which are much more focused on elite male warriors, as we'll see. 
this this comes out as well in what we know of the uh, the script that flows from the Minoans uh, so-called linear A, which we'll talk about in a moment, and is adapted by the Greek-speaking Mycenaeans with linear B. So for example, uh, the Greek word potnia, or in linear B, potania, uh, the lady or mistress, might have represented the goddess or the political or religious leader of a location to whom uh, food offerings would be made that could later be redistributed to the people surrounding that location. Um, for example, the lady of the labyrinth uh, or the potnia of the labyrinth in Linear B, uh, the Mycenaean script, might represent um, this earlier uh, Minoan deity or priestess uh, to whom offerings could be made there at Knossos. We have similar constructions on the Greek mainland. For example, the lady or potnia at Athens has been hypothesized as a source for later cultural memory of Athene or Athena, the goddess. And that sort of takes us to uh, one of the interesting social and economic dimensions of the so-called palaces, of which Knossos was one in Minoan culture. They seem to have operated as these huge uh, hubs for collecting and redistributing resources, grain, wine, and olive oil. So on one estimate, uh, at Knossos alone, uh, some of the, uh, the pithoi, or these kind of giant human-sized um, receptacles could have contained enough supplies to support 20,000 citizens. So when citizens were making offerings, uh, let's say for the sake of argument, to the, the potnia of the labyrinth uh, or one of these other Minoan centers, uh, those offerings might have supported, through redistribution, uh, a pretty large community. And we're going to come back to this a little later in Greek cultural memory of Crete as well. Uh, there's a number of these palaces on Crete, just to confirm and clarify from this period, not only Knossos, but also Festos, Malia, Catozacro, uh, and more discovered elsewhere. We don't know very much uh, about the, the details of the religious life of the Minoans, partly because the language that underlies the Linear A script, in which our only written sources tend to be preserved, for example, uh, on this tablet, which was baked uh, by accident, uh, from clay in one of the destructions of the palace by fire. Uh, this is basically accounting records, but it's also undeciphered. Um, we know that the script was adapted to Linear B to write in the language of the later Greek-speaking conquerors. Uh, so you can kind of imagine, uh, since we've learned a little bit from the Linear B script where we do know the Greek underneath, that uh, lots of this information documents how this massive uh, redistributive economy might work, um, how religious offerings were flowing through the island, and in general some of the more mundane accounting uh, facts like how many sheep there are where. I've just given you an image of one of these uh, huge human-sized jars in which, um, in which some of these resources were stored, and you can connect that with the Linear A writing system which helped to document them. So hopefully that gives us a little bit of a feel. We've got this, this huge, vast network of smaller um, cities, communities, so-called palaces or major redistributive centers around the island of Crete. Um, why are we thinking about it here as we're sort of moving into considerations of the later Greek polis, other than the fact that it's just intrinsically fascinating? Um, one is that Minoan Crete is a likely source uh, even though um, the people here were probably not speaking Greek, as far as we can tell, for a substantial component of the later Greek religious customs, mythology, and some social customs as well, uh, that really flourished in later Greek thought. So there's a real continuity, but it's difficult to identify which elements there are that were continuous. There's lots of speculation about this, and there has been ever since Evan's excavations. So for example, there's a vision of Minoan Crete as a matriarchal and peaceful culture. Again, these uh, representations of women in strong positions of prominence um, and cities or communities that have no fortifications, in contrast to the later heavily fortified Mycenaean centers. Um, the recognition that many of these communities are founded on the worship of a goddess who appears in an epiphany and brings her worshippers to a kind of vision or ecstasy 
and perhaps uh, a young god in the sort of traditional view that that Evans also suggested who attends her, uh, who seems very much in line with the famous example of an archetypal god who dies and rises again in the motif proposed by James Fraser. Uh, there's also a lot of cultural memory that has been emphasized today on the uh, recollection of King Minos as a lawgiver, a just lawgiver, who promoted social harmony uh, through laws that he brought from Zeus on the mountain on one tradition every nine years. For example, this is remembered by Plato in uh, his dialogues, the Gorgias and the Laws. There's also the possible influence of Minoan Crete on legal customs in later Crete, historically in Sparta. Uh, Aristotle in his Politics, for example, Book 2, Chapters 9 to 10, develops and describes some of the ways that indigenous Cretan traditions might have influenced Greek settlers there. Uh, for example, maybe including these practices of agricultural redistribution, uh, shared meals, uh, citizen equality, maybe even the relative autonomy of women in the Spartan polis especially, which seems to decline gradually later on Crete, though it remains an important element. There's also the sense that Minoan Crete is a possible influence on later Greek religious and philosophical conceptions of initiation and human immortality, especially through mystery religions like the Eleusinian Mysteries, which we'll come back to in a little bit. Uh, Diodorus Siculus, for example, writing quite a bit later but with earlier sources, describes some ways that the Cretans at least regarded um, themselves in, in his own day and his sources' time as reflecting uh, the source of these mystery religions in their own earlier history. The uh, Minoan culture is full of such beautiful and vivid art and naturalistic expression that it's worth taking a little bit of time just to get a sense for this. Um, in the explosion of a volcano that erupted in uh, Aquatiri or Santorini, the island of Thera, um, a large Minoan community seems to have been uh, covered in ash in a way that protected it for millennia and allows us to get at some of the kind of painting, art, uh, organization, architecture that is lost on the island of Crete itself. So for example, this is the um, really light and lovely spring fresco from Aquatiri. Uh, we also have lots of uh, wares like vases and cups. This is the Minoan so-called harvester vase, which seems to represent a kind of a celebratory procession with the harvest. This was found at Hyatriata on Crete uh, around about the 15th century BC and is now in the archaeological museum at Heraklion. But just the kind of sense of joy and the, um, the openness of the figures gives a bit of a feeling for Minoan art as well. The Minoans seem to have been interested in sport. Uh, there's this, uh, this lovely image of young boxers, uh, also found from Akrotiri, um, and this so-called flotilla fresco that seems to represent uh, Minoan ships in action, remembering that it was a fairly significant naval power. Uh, Minoan artists were fascinated by the natural world, it seems like, uh, painting dolphins. This is the dolphin fresco. Uh, it's heavily restored, but you can uh, see the parts that are original uh, and understand something of the joy in the sea taken by a maritime culture like the Minoans. They were also fascinated, it seems like, by practices uh, quite unique on Crete of bull leaping, uh, possibly in the courtyards of these great palaces. And this is also an opportunity to introduce another factor in Minoan art, which is the extraordinary ability to make works of this tiny size. Um, so this is a very small seal stone used for impressing wax or maybe clay, uh, could be worn in a ring. Um, and even in this very small size, you can see just the dynamism of this human figure in an almost impossible position with this, this really rich sense of movement leaping over a bull in action. Uh, this is from about 1700 BC, a little bit earlier, but also gives a sense of the style of Minoan art. A great deal of these smaller works of Minoan art, these seal stones, seem to have what we at least identify as ritual or religious content. Um, this seal stone, for example, found just recently a few years ago from the tomb of the griffin warrior in Pylos, 
on the Greek mainland. That's a Mycenaean center, but this is certainly of Minoan make. Uh, represents perhaps uh, the Minoan goddess and her worshippers. Um, you also have similar small imagery of the goddess uh, as the sort of master of the mountain, uh, possibly with, at sometimes thought, the young god as an attendant. Um, and this idea of the goddess and her worshippers as uh, engaging in a sort of ecstatic ritual activity in nature, as it's sometimes been seen, has also been uh, at least suggested as a source for some depictions of later menads in Greek culture, or comparable figures, women who are engaging in ritual activities in the wild, in the forested mountains, uh, and experiencing visions, or also uh, men in the train of Dionysus, who are engaging in similar activities. Um, a key sort of theme being the location on the mountain, which is associated with the woods outside the city. Uh, this particular object, the so-called Ring of Nestor that you're seeing on screen now, is uh, a bit of a more contested case. Its authenticity is uncertain, although uh, quite recently, uh, some scholarly views at least have shifted back in its favor. But Arthur Evans, the, uh, the excavator of Knossos, suspected that this was a representation of the Minoan view of the afterlife, uh, a kind of analog to the Isles of the Blessed in Egyptian and later Greek thought. Um, and if it is, there's beautiful opportunities to think about the connections between Minoan conceptions of the afterlife and particularly the, the later Greek mystery traditions, which at least some later Greek sources attribute to the Minoans as well. So Minoan Crete uh, declined through a series of destructions of these so-called palaces, which culminated in the destruction of the centers at Malia, Festos, and Zacro around the middle of the 15th century, with only Knossos surviving, but probably reoccupied um, by Greek speakers writing in Linear B. Uh, with a new interest, as we can tell, from art and burial practices in weapons and war. These were likely Mycenaeans from the mainland, from the Argolid. The Mycenaeans adapted many elements of the developed indigenous culture, technology, art, religion, maybe later legal customs, and Minoan crafts flourished in Mycenaean centers. The um, indigenous Etiocretans, as they're remembered in later sources, were gradually driven, it seems, to the east of Crete, where we find a number of bilingual inscriptions later in the so-called Etiocretan language, uh, now written in an alphabetic script, like Greek, and Greek as well. So uh, laws, for example, at Dreros that are written in both languages. So we're moving next to the cultural memory and history of Mycenae. Um, we're still with the Bronze Age, second millennium BC, but we're moving to the mainland of Greece. Uh, and to situate us in our geography again, this brings us here to the Argolid, close to the later city of Sparta. Um, Mycenae is also a late Bronze Age city in the Peloponnese, the island of Pelops, uh, the southern Greek mainland, and at its peak around the middle of the 14th century, sustained a population of about 30,000. It was also remembered in later cultural memory uh, through Homer, as the seat of King Agamemnon, who led the Greek army against Troy. This memory is well aligned with the atmosphere of Mycenae. If you think about the picture on screen now, which illustrates the so-called Cyclopean masonry, the fortification, the Lion Gate, this is quite different in sensibility than some of the Minoan centers, which, at least according to a fairly broad consensus, were mostly not fortified. This is a military center, and it's the center of a culture that was remembered, at least, as sustained by martial valor, by the valorization, the celebration of achievement and excellence in battle. Um, that atmosphere is also brought out, in a way, by some of the finds at Mycenae. So Heinrich Schliemann, the excavator, uh, who brought some of these finds to light, um, uh, published, for example, this Mask of Agamemnon. Uh, it may not necessarily be the mask of Agamemnon himself. Uh, it's a burial mask that caused a sensation when it was discovered uh, 
Uh, it dates to about 1500 BC, and it really captured popular imagination. It must belong to this famous Homeric hero. We also have uh, images of warriors preparing for battle, like this uh, warrior vase from the 12th century BC in Mycenae. And with both those material records and the later literary and cultural memory that Homer represents, it's really no surprise that Mycenae is remembered as a kind of warrior elite society, characterized by uh, a network of different states. Let me pause here for a minute just to stress that Mycenae is a single center, this particularly great city in a way, the, uh, the first among equals of many similar palatial centers, which also each one had a king or wanox and a palace or wanacteron and a whole sophisticated administration. Um, just as in Homer, Agamemnon is remembered as, in a way, the first among equals, perhaps, uh, of all the many chiefs or kings who come with him to Troy, Mycenae may have been uh, the most important of these centers, which are then not entirely inaptly called Mycenaean after this particular culture, given uh, the order in which these centers were excavated. You can also see these uh, replicas of Mycenaean swords and cups, some of these finds from Mycenae itself and other so-called Mycenaean centers. And when we think a little bit about the oral tradition of Homer, which we talked about earlier in the series, uh, that is the memories of the, uh, the heroes who fought at Troy on the Greek side, as well as the heroes who fought on the Trojan side, and the oral traditions that survive their battles and uh, the Greeks return home, um, we can recognize a kind of blend in them of their own experience, say around the 8th or 7th centuries BC, hundreds of years later, and the historical facts, to whatever degree we can recover them, of the Bronze Age of Mycenaean society. The Mycenaeans kept records much as the Minoans had done, uh, on those sorts of tablets we saw a little while ago, in this case in the script we call Linear B, uh, which was adapted from Linear A. So to explain, um, these linear scripts are kind of like letters. Um, in English, for example, the letters we use A, B, and C, uh, the alphabet, but they represent syllables. And uh, those syllables can be used to write any language, just like letters can be used to write any language, admittedly imperfectly. Um, in this case, the Minoan language underlay the original Linear A script, which was adapted to write it. The Greek speakers, um, so far as we can tell, who were the Mycenaeans, who eventually conquered the island of Crete, uh, came to use the Linear B script based on the Linear A writing system or letters to write Greek. Uh, and this is pretty interesting for us historically. We can see many of the ways that Minoan administrative elements uh, permeated the Mycenaean culture that followed. We can also see the names of some Olympian deities, uh, uh, gods like Dionysus, in Linear B from the Bronze Age, suggesting something of the continuity and the much earlier prehistory of those divinities who we come to know and perhaps love from the later Greek historical period. One other thing to say while we're sort of geeking out about Linear B, um, the name of the city, uh, Mycenae itself, Mucanae in Greek, we also have from Linear B, uh, and it may literally mean uh, in Greek, mukes or mushroom, and there is a later uh, a mythological tradition about the hero Perseus, reported by the travel writer Pausanias, that he found a really interesting mushroom at Mycenae, and that's where it gets its name. Uh, it's a plural name, Mucanae, just like Athens is a plural name, Athenae, and these are relatively common in many of these earlier Greek communities, especially maybe those that have sources in the Bronze Age. So we've talked a little bit about the Minoan culture of Crete and the Mycenaean culture of the mainland. And one of the contrasts that we've drawn is a sense that there's a real um, uh, sort of religious sophistication, um, artistic sensitivity, interest in nature, and dynamism in art on Crete uh, 
that then is in a way mixed with the martial interests uh, of the conquerors or settlers from the mainland who arrive on Crete. And gradually, um, there's a permeation of the Mycenaean centers with Minoan culture. One way that this uh, kind of interconnection can be illustrated is through a, a seal found quite recently, um, often called the Pylos Combat Agate, based on its fine spot in Pylos, uh, the city of the Homeric hero Nestor. Quite recently, just a few years ago, uh, this is almost certainly of the make of a Minoan craftsman. It was found in the Griffin Warrior tomb uh, in Pylos. Uh, it probably dates to about 1450. It's very small, uh, about 3.6 centimeters long. Uh, and it was found by a team working with the University of Cincinnati. There's an amazing sense of movement here. And considering how small the object is, an incredible triumph of craftsmanship an interest in human anatomy. It's hardly naturalistic, but it certainly is natural, if you know what I mean. This really moves. It feels like a snapshot in time. It has then that kind of Minoan dynamism and artfulness applied to a very Mycenaean theme, the hero in battle. And uh, one way to, uh, to connect this with the later Homeric content is actually to think about Homeric scenes. Homer represents the hero Achilles drawing his sword and uh, taking on uh, an opponent who holds a spear uh, in a way that may reflect this image, although there's also differences, um, where Achilles is on uh, a rampage at this point in Homer's Iliad. Uh, it seems as if the figure perhaps in the combat agate is acting in self-defense, being quick enough to uh, attack his opponent before that spear is set to flight. So here we have something of a sense of the, the connection of cultures that characterizes the fusion of Minoan and Mycenaean elements, and in a way helps to understand the birth of later Greek culture and two elements that we'll find in later Greek culture, and at least as I'll try to argue, philosophy. Uh, Mycenae also, and most of the centers of the Mycenaean culture as a whole, suffered a destruction in a kind of systemic collapse of the whole Bronze Age culture across Greece and actually much of the Mediterranean and Middle Eastern world. This is sometimes called the Late Bronze Age Collapse, dating between about 1200 and 1150. There could have been a lot of reasons for this, and there's a lot of theories. Uh, there's uh, certainly some element of climate change. There are some events of violence, invasion, and emigration. There's a shift to the use of iron. It wasn't called the Bronze Age for no reason. There's some changes in military strategy and structure that could have, um, could have uh, distorted or changed uh, some of the power structures that had existed throughout the Bronze Age. And there may have been, especially in the face of all these different challenges, uh, failure of the political and economic systems that had sustained this palatial civilization of the, uh, of the Mycenaeans. Some ancient Greek traditions associate this period with the migration and arrival of another cultural group. Um, also Greek speakers, like the Mycenaeans, but speaking a different dialect of Greek, often called the Dorian dialect. And in some traditions, for example, in the historian Herodotus, uh, writing many hundreds of years later, um, we're into the 5th century now, uh, thought that perhaps the Dorians had hailed from a more northerly region in Greece, like Thessaly. In any case, uh, earlier Mycenaeans uh, spoke, it seems, perhaps, a dialect closer to the later Ionian dialect, uh, which was associated with Athens and some of the Greek settlements that had cultural links with Athens. The Dorian dialect, interestingly, was especially associated later with Sparta, and with some of the Greek communities on Crete. This hypothesis of, we'll call it the Dorian invasion hypothesis, is problematic in many ways, is not necessarily widely accepted today. It was familiar in ancient Greek sources especially, and we'll come back to it a few times later on. However, the Mycenaean world ended, 
And it seems to have been, again, through a whole combination of factors, it's interesting to think of how climate change might have played a part. But the result was what's sometimes called a dark age, not because it was a bad time necessarily, or not necessarily, but because it was a time when we don't have a lot of records to go on. Uh, those Linear B writings stopped. There's a lot less in the material record to work with. There's a major interruption in a lot of the um, material traditions that we work with to try to get information about these periods. Hence the name Dark Age, dark to us. Also, uh, it's sometimes called the geometric period from some of the pretty cool geometrically patterned pottery that was popular in this kind of intermediary period. But this period in between the fall of Mycenaean civilization and the rise of what is properly called usually the polis, um, or the recognizable later Greek city-state in the 8th century, that's usually called the Dark Age. And in that time, there was a kind of oral memory of the Bronze Age preserved in epic tradition, as in Homer and in Hesiod. So we've had this sort of very brief introduction to ancient Knossos on Crete, the Minoan culture, and ancient Mycenae on the mainland, the Mycenaean culture. And we've thought a bit about the collapse of both and recognize that there's this, this time in between those Bronze Age cultures and the historical culture of ancient Greece as we know it through literary sources written in alphabetic Greek. To try to uh, situate this in our conversation about the history of ideas and philosophy, um, I'd like to explore some of the ways that those Bronze Age cultures were remembered, and in particular, how Minoan Crete was remembered in later Greek sources. This is pretty tenuous terrain, so it's less history than the history of cultural memory. Um, but in a way, I hope you'll see from some of the resonances that we can bring out, especially as we work through some of the next points in the series, that there are some, some connections here worth drawing attention to particularly because they seem to be one of the central strands that will come up again and again in Platonism, or the philosophy of Plato and his followers. So here's one element to start from that's relatively simple, even though it comes from a later source. This is a text from Diodorus Siculus, uh, writing around the first century BC, uh, though his sources might have been quite a bit earlier. The inhabitants of Crete say, that the most ancient people of their island were those known as Etiocretans, in Greek that's true Cretans, sprung from the soil itself, so an indigenous people, who were displaced by the later settlers. The greater number of the gods had their origin in their land, according to the Cretans. And Orpheus, the legendary pre-Homeric bard, who was endowed with an exceptional gift of poetry and song, also became a pupil of theirs, that is, of the Etiocretans, and he was subsequently the first to introduce initiatory rites and mysteries to the Greeks. I'm going to come back in a little bit to this theme of mysteries and initiation, but let's just hold that thought for a minute. So we've thought a bit about how, uh, according to Diodorus, who draws on some earlier sources here, um, the Etiocretans uh, reported uh, or at least perhaps he has access to these uh, intermediary settler accounts of what the Etiocretans reported, that the gods began on their island, uh, and that they had taught uh, mystery religions at initiation. The first of these gods, uh, Diodorus goes on for some time here, uh, the dactyls from the region around Mount Ida were those who discovered the use of fire, copper, iron, and the next generation, we're eliding a fair bit of the text here, the Kurites made home in mountainous places, thickly wooded, and they excelled in wisdom, in Greek sunesis, which means something like understanding. They gathered sheep into flocks, discovered the making of honey, and they showed humanity how to live and how to associate in a shared life. That is, in a way, starting community formation. They initiated especially homonoia in Greek, a sort of common-mindedness, having a shared purpose. So in a way, cities, uh, not necessarily large-scale, but communities that were founded on cooperation. So 
if we sort of take this tradition seriously, uh, encoded in some of the cultural memory of the later Greek gods, and we'll see a bit more about this in a moment, there's a recollection of this sort of story of the beginning of certain traditions socially that became significant later on. Diodorus goes on, the Titans. You might remember the Titans from earlier when we were reading Hesiod, the generation of gods before the Olympians. Well, they had their dwelling about Knossos, that is about uh, this central city of Minoan Crete, at a place where even to this day people point out foundations of a house of Rhea. You might remember Rhea, mother of Zeus, uh, and her name means flow, uh, one of the eldest and most significant of the Titans in the generation before the Olympians. And a cypress grove, which has been concentrated, uh, consecrated to her from ancient times. Kronos, we'll remember him as well, you might recall his sickle, there were some uh, ominous things that Kronos was up to with his sickle in the story in Hesiod, but here it has a bit of a, a different um, flavor. It's about uh, his role in the harvest, about the ease of bringing forth in a sustainable way the fruits of the earth. So Kronos, since he was eldest of the Titans, became king and made his subjects change to a civilized life. Well, what does that mean? Well, he introduced justice and sincerity of soul, so fairness between people. Think back to Homonoia again. And Haplotes Psukes, this is literally uh, simplicity, maybe in the sense of sincerity, as the translator suggests, uh, of the psyche. So this sort of simplicity of our psychology. And this is why the tradition has come down to later generations that the people of his time were good-hearted, altogether guileless and blessed. In fact, Hesiod uh, remembers this kind of golden age where the earth gives freely of her plenty, and there's also a tradition in which Kronos is remembered as the governor of the Isles of the Blessed, uh, the immortal afterlife of blessed human beings. And that seems to be what Diodorus is hearkening back to here. So pulling back a little bit more again, uh, it seems as if the Titans, displaced by the Olympians, are sort of like the Minoans, displaced by the Greeks arriving with this, uh, this martial culture, if you like, um, or the Greek speakers, at least, who are represented in the Linear B texts. This is also remembered in some way in, in somewhat earlier sources, classical sources, uh, as the legendary justice, not only of Kronos, but of some of the lawgivers of Crete. So, for instance, uh, Socrates says in Plato's Laws, possibly the last thing he wrote, it might not all have been written by Plato. Um, there's one tradition that his student Philip of Opus might have, have completed it. Um, but in any case, Socrates quite early in the conversation says, tell me, and he's talking to a Cretan and a Spartan. Socrates himself is an Athenian. Who do you give the credit to for establishing your codes of law? And Cleinias, this is the Cretan, says, a god. Among us Cretans, it's Zeus, and every ninth year Minos used to go to a consultation with his father Zeus and laid down laws. It's no accident that the laws of the Cretans have such a high reputation in the entire Greek world. So what does this sort of the, the Cretan justice of laws have to do with the story before, other than that, well, Kronos is remembered for justice, sincerity of soul, and so on, and the fairness and homonoia of people. Aristotle gives an interesting bit of context to this. He talks about how colonists coming from the Greek mainland to Crete um, adopted the constitution that they found existing there among the indigenous people. Thinking back a little to the way that um, Minoan uh, cultural reflexes, um, art, technology, maybe legal practices seem to have influenced the Mycenaeans, even though Aristotle's talking about a somewhat later period. And to this day, Aristotle says, the perioikoi, these are the people who live around the city and, and work the land for the hegemonic Greek speakers, um, but at least some of them are, are not, are um, indigenous to Crete. Well, they're still governed by the original laws which Minos is supposed to have enacted. And of all the fruits of the earth, one portion, according to these laws, is assigned to the gods and to the service of the state, and another to the common meals, so that men, women, and children are all supported out of a common stock. The legislator has many ingenious ways of securing moderation, moderation, incidentally, famous uh, Greek value, 
Delphic value, everything in moderation, including moderation, it's sometimes said, but a Delphic conjunction made in Algon, nothing too much. Okay, so just thinking back for a minute, think of those great big storage jars, linear A, the redistribution of goods uh, in Minoan Crete. Uh, to give a bit more context to this, Aristotle's writing as if uh, Crete cities in the chapter around this little section that we've just read, traditionally a hundred in number, somehow shared a similar political structure, uh, even though there were so many of them separated by some 150 miles. Uh, for example, common meals, elected executives, a council, and a popular assembly. Uh, some of this structure was perhaps later copied by Sparta. Um, and surprisingly, there's a lot of inscriptional evidence to support this kind of consistency in the historical period, that is, quite a bit later from the Bronze Age, across all that space. So one theory that's been advanced is that some of the indigenous Etiocretans, um, possibly identical with our Minoans, driven to the east of the island, might have taught the codification of laws as some of those bilingual texts in Etiocretan and Greek. Um, for example, at Dreros in the sanctuary of Apollo Delphinios, uh, Apollo who's like a dolphin, and we'll talk about Delphi a little later in that word, might suggest. So putting this all together, um, there's at least a sort of tenuous suggestion here that the value for the common meals, the offering of food resources to, well, the state and in the old times, perhaps the so-called palace, the goddess, which would then be returned to the people around to make sure that everybody had enough, well, that, that all of that, still part of the so-called laws of Minos, uh, in a time that Aristotle at least has sources to talk about, might be at least an inspiration, Minoan or Etiocretan, and that the written codification of these laws could also be something that the Greek speakers in Crete might have adapted from the Minoans as well. This isn't to draw too strong a line, and it's a, it's a pretty sort of, again, tenuous suggestion, more based on cultural memory than anything else. Um, but it's interesting, I hope, and there's some elements in the implicit social philosophy that we'll find again when we're spending more time with Plato in a few weeks and later in the series. So that's one element, the sort of social philosophy. Another, perhaps in a way easier to get at, is memories of the influence uh, of the Minoans or Teocretans, perhaps, as has often been suggested in antiquity and today, uh, though it's also a somewhat tenuous argument in some ways, on initiations and mysteries and religion. So, for example, our same author, Diodorus, uh, writing again a fair bit later, but with some earlier sources, suggests that the rite of initiation celebrated at Eleusis by the Athenians, this is the most famous, it's the mystery of uh, achieving immortality or blessedness in the afterlife, it's a series of practices sacred to the goddesses Demeter and Persephone. On the left-hand side in the screen, you can see a classical period, 5th century BC relief, showing uh, Triptolemus uh, receiving wheat sheaves from Demeter and Persephone, uh, symbolizing agriculture, and in some way through the mystery, the possibility of new life, immortality. Well, so this mystery, Diodorus says, uh, well, it's usually a secret, as it is at Eleusis, just what it's about. There in other places, like Samothrace and Thrace, where Orpheus came from, there's another mention of the legendary bard Orpheus, with whom many mythic and philosophical traditions are associated. But it's different on Crete. According to Diodorus, at Knossos, it's been the custom for ancient times, it is for a long, long time, that these initiatory rites should be handed down to everybody openly. So that's kind of interesting. Um, and there's, there's a lot of interest in these Eleusinian rites as significant both for uh, the understanding of human immortality and the domestication of agriculture and the possibility of using agriculture to make sure that there's enough food for everybody. So think back again to that kind of redistributive economy or at least the suggestion of it. This is a passage, again, it's quite a bit later. It's from the first century uh, with Cicero, uh, the Roman statesman and orator, among many excellent and indeed divine institutions which your Athens has brought forth, 
and contributed to human life, none, in my opinion, is better than those Eleusinian mysteries. For by their means we've been brought out of our barbarous and savage mode of life, a little bit of judgment there, and educated and refined to a state of civilization, a little bit of judgment there, and as the rites are called initiation, so in very truth we have learned from them the beginnings of life, and have gained the power not only to live happily but also to die with a better hope. So there's two elements to the Eleusinian mysteries in, in a way, the sense that somehow they're a source of agriculture and justice and peace socially, and also that somehow they're a source of a, a kind of vision that leads to immortality and bliss. Uh, and as we'll see for, uh, for Plato, as he represents his own teacher, Socrates, this is importantly associated with what philosophy is about. Philosophy also can offer this kind of vision and somehow is similar to the Eleusinian mysteries in the transformation of vision that it offers. This is Socrates speaking in the Phaedo. He's about to face his own execution and he's talking about human immortality. In this context, it's likely that those who established the rites of the mysteries for us were not inferior persons, but were speaking in riddles, this is the root of our word enigma, long ago, when they said that whoever arrives in Hades' place without the mysteries, a muetos, without initiation, a telestos, will wallow in the mire, whereas one who arrives purified and initiated will dwell with the gods. There are indeed, as those concerned with the mysteries say, many who carry the thyrsus, uh, this is the sort of ritual implement of Dionysus and the Menads, uh, the women who follow him, and some of those associated with his worship. But the Bacchants, the true Dionysians, are few. That is to say, many look like they're followers of the mysteries, but the true followers are rare. Those true followers, he thinks, are none other than those who have practiced the love of wisdom or philosophy in the right way. So all I wanted to suggest here is there's a, a way that at least the language and iconography of the transformative vision of the mysteries, the epiphany that they're associated with, um, both in terms of social philosophy and this kind of uh, radical new understanding of the human condition, are either appropriated or somehow serve to inspire uh, the project that Plato and perhaps Socrates, uh, as Plato represents him, consider philosophy to be concerned with. Uh, some of what they're talking about, for example, the thyrsus can be illustrated from this image. This is uh, from the 5th century BC. It's a uh, menad recognized, incidentally, the, uh, the snake in her hair. And you might think back to the Minoan snake goddess we looked at a little bit earlier, uh, or at least the figurine that's often represented as a goddess. And she's bearing this sort of staff with pine cones. That's the thyrsus that they're talking about. The point is that one can carry a thyrsus and have a snake in your hair, uh, but it doesn't necessarily mean you'll have this sort of transformative vision that the mysteries are all about. Uh, to actually have that vision, to actually be transformed by it, that's the true meaning of them. Um, we also have some slightly later classical period representations of the Eleusinian mysteries. And again, it's sort of interesting to think about what, if any, resonance with these much earlier sources in Minoan Crete there might be, at least just taking seriously the ancient suggestions as we saw in Diodorus, to some degree in Aristotle, and in others, that there's some important continuity or connection there to spend some time with. One more thing to say about cultural memory. Uh, there's a, a tradition that the oracle or the priesthood at Delphi was founded by priests from Knossos on Crete. Uh, here's a little bit of that tradition from the Homeric hymn to Apollo. Phoebus Apollo, shining Apollo, considered in his heart which people he might bring in as priests who would be his servants in rocky Pytho, that's Delphi. While pondering this, he noticed a swift ship on the wine-dark sea. Many good men were aboard, Cretans from Minoan Knossos, who performed sacrifices for the gold-bladed lord, that's Apollo, and announced prophecies from Phoebus Apollo whenever he delivers an oracle from the laurel tree in the hollow under Mount Parnassus. That's Delphi. They were sailing in their dark ship to sandy Pylos, 
We've met Pylos before, it's where the, the Griffin Warrior tomb was and that beautiful combat agate to do business and trade with the Pylians. In the form of a dolphin, Phoebus Apollo joined them at sea, leaping aboard their swift ship. With his breath, Lord Apollo, who works from afar, easily guided the ship, which kept sailing along its route. You might think of some of those images of dolphins and ships we saw before when we were studying Cretan art. Later, he says to the Cretan priests, Make an altar at the seashore, kindle a fire on it, offer up white barley. Note, not a blood sacrifice. Um, these kinds of vegetarian sacrifices also might have had some association with Mycenaean practice, as remembered in later Greece, uh, which in turn could have Minoan connections, though that's another tenuous connection. Then stand close around the altar and pray, because I first leapt onto your swift ship as a dolphin, says Apollo, out of the misty sea, pray to me as Delphinios the Dolphini Apollo, hence the name Delphi. The Cretans followed him to Pytho, keeping the beat and singing a paean to the healer god like the paean singers in Crete, and those whom the divine muse fills with honey-voiced song they danced. You might remember here that, that beautiful kind of energy in the harvester vase all the way back to the 15th century BC, Bronze Age Crete. So all that's just to say, uh, Delphi, the city we'll be talking about next, there is some connection with Knossos, with the Minoan priesthood, religion. Of course, the most famous institution at Delphi, speaking of, of those images of ecstatic dance, vision, discovery, and the mysteries, is the oracle at Delphi, the Pythia herself. This is pretty tempting to think of the, the oracle at Delphi herself as following or expressing a tradition that stretches back in a line all the way to the goddesses and priestesses of Minoan Crete, to the epiphanic visions, think of prophecy for the oracle, as well as these uh, social philosophies, perhaps, of redistribution, of offering to the goddess that comes back to the people, and the mysteries of agriculture that are associated with that story as at Eleusis. Of course, it's very difficult to make this sort of story um, historically clear or convincing, but it at the same time does seem to reflect something genuine about the cultural memory that really shaped the, uh, the look back from later Greece on Minoan Crete and on Delphi, as we can see from some of these traditions about the foundation of the priesthood there from Knossos. Some of the ideas specifically associated with the Oracle at Delphi, like self-knowledge and sincerity of purpose, and even the intellectual humility that Socrates discovered from her statement unexpectedly to his friend, that there's nobody wiser than Socrates. What could that mean? He thought after many decades of asking questions that the Pythia must have meant that person among you is wisest who, like Socrates, recommends uh, to themselves or recognizes that their own wisdom is not worth that much. Uh, all these ideas are certainly characteristic of a sort of philosophical tradition that influences Plato in particular. Whether we can draw lines again from any of this uh, back through time to earlier sources Again, that's pretty tenuous, but it's an interesting sort of soil to look at, to, to try to see how some of these ideas that are so important later are shaped in a place and through institutions that have these much, much earlier roots, even if they're under the ground where it's hard to see them. Another way of thinking of this relationship with later classical Greek literature and aesthetics is to think of these, these two different aspects that we've spent some time with. Uh, the, uh, the worship, again, of the goddess who is epiphanic, who uh, generates a kind of transformative vision, uh, as we see in some of these seal stones um, associated with snakes. On the other hand, uh, uh, also is associated with this kind of social philosophy that we've spent some time with, closer, if anything, to the polis hero we talked about in our discussion of myth, who emphasizes uh, cooperation and almost a sort of altruism or common purpose. Then we juxtapose that with the, uh, the Homeric style warrior who seeks honor and Time. And we can think of some of the artistic productions that only recently have been discovered we spent a bit of time with, like uh, the combat agate found in the Griffin warrior tomb, uh, 
uh, of Minoan make expressing some of those Mycenaean ideals, in a way it exemplifies the fusion, arguably, of that culture of martial honor of the Mycenaeans with the um, some of the, the philosophy, the religious ideas that we might be able to recognize traceable back as far as Minoan Crete. Um, Again, these are, are not historical arguments so much as they are recognitions of resonances in cultural memory that I think we'll detect again and again, especially as we spend more time with Plato. So in summary of where we've been, we've talked a little bit about Bronze Age Knossos and the palatial culture so-called of the Minoans and the religious and cultural ideas that go with it. We've spent time with Bronze Age Mycenae as well, and it's more martial culture and conquest of Minoan Crete, but with the introduction of Minoan cultural elements into Mycenaean tradition. And finally, we've looked at some aspects of the memory of these cultures in later Greece through agriculture, through mysteries, initiation, traditions of immortality, and as well, especially in Delphi, with the priesthood said to have come from Knossos, and associated at least, again, in some iconography and imagery in the mountains of Delphi with ecstasy, dance, and the oracle's prophecy. And we'll come next to talk more about Delphi in detail. Delphi in detail.